my company makes between hundred to hundred fifty thousand a month, I would say, give or take. A month. Yeah. And how old are you? Twenty. Twenty. Yeah. Mm, okay. What do you do? So I run a no code product agency, so designing, developing apps using no code, basically. And so you're only twenty. You're doing hundred fifty grand a month with yeah. no code dev, basically. Yeah. So why did you choose to go down this path? If I look back on kind of my life, I've never been technical. And so that, that was kind of a big thing for me because I've been very into, you know, solving problems, building technologies. In high school, I, I launched, you know, an app that was basically like a Kijiji, but for my school. So the idea was like sell. I always saw people buying and selling things on Snapchat, like shoes, phones, whatever. So I was like, how can I build an app to solve this? So then wasn't able to code. So what did I do? I looked into, you know, what are the other options? And I found Bubble. Started learning and tinkering with that. And two weeks later, I had an app. Launched it to my school. Got my, almost my whole school to use it. And I was like, wow. And so that was like the light bulb moment where I was like, this technology is actually super powerful. Um, and um, kind of fell into it from there. So you literally had an idea for an app for your school. You didn't know how to code, but you built it in two weeks with Bubble. Exactly. And it was yeah. software. Yeah. Yeah. And that was what? How long ago? Three years ago? Yeah, it's probably like grade 10. So, yeah. Wow. Okay. And so you've had an interesting journey with online businesses. Yeah. This wasn't something that you immediately stuck with. But tell me how you came to the conclusion to build a no-code dev agency. Yeah, I would say, I would say like many people probably watching this, I very early knew, early on knew that I wasn't going to go to school. I wasn't going to go to college. And so uh, through our high school, like going back to that app, I was trying to figure out like, what can I do? What's going to catch so I don't need to go to college? Because ultimately, like, I'm not just going to not going to go to school and have nothing to do. Like I need, you know, to actually be able to show my parents and show myself that I can work on something and be successful. And so in, in 2020, um, I started a media kind of marketing agency where I would shoot real estate videos for realtors um, and just help with like social media ads, that kind of thing. Um, and all of a sudden COVID hit and you know, that was a really big opportunity that I saw. One, because I didn't need to go to school. So I made an agreement with my teachers that if I just did the assignments, I wouldn't need to show up to the Zoom calls. Because at that point, it was just like, you know, one hour, two hour Zoom calls every day. But I literally couldn't go because I had like meetings booked all day. You were in high school? Yes, yeah, <laughs> high school. So I literally had to go to each one of my teachers. And, you know, I was like, if I, because, you know, they grade you for, to go to class. And mm -hmm. so I would just fail if mm -hmm. I... um had to go to school because it was either between like saving my business, meeting with my clients or like mm -hmm. going to class. So COVID like really helped because ultimately like if that was in person, like there's no way I would have been able to make that same argument. They would have been like, yeah, no. hey, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, I eventually also saw an opportunity that a lot of my clients were like, we need to go digital. Like we need solutions to like be able to, you know, Zoom is one option, but you know, it doesn't really cut, cut it to like the real world or what it used to be. And so we had this one like Taekwondo like studio that was like, we need to like, you know, really change our business. And at, at the time, like people didn't know how long this was going to last, right? This could have been like the next five years. We mm -hmm. had no idea. And so, um, again, going back to like, how can we like help them? You know, software is how I solved that problem previously, as far as just like, that's where my head goes. And I don't know how to, I don't know how to code. So where do I go? Bubble again. And so I built that first thing on bubble. It was pretty janky. Didn't like, wasn't, <laughs> wasn't like our proudest work. But um, it really taught me, like, wow, this is actually a real tool that businesses and startups can use. It's not just some gimmicky, like, thing that, like, I can use to, like, launch something to my school. And so that was really the catalyst um, and uh, went all in on Bubble, you know, became, like, an official Bubble agency, hired, you know, you know designers, developers, and, uh, yeah, the rest is history. You're building for some of the most legitimate companies in the world. Right. You have some Fortune 500 clients at 20 years old, which is insane, right. but you're also building software products for some of the biggest creators on YouTube. So why are these people coming to you and why are they choosing a no code agency over traditional dev when they have the unlimited resources basically? The productized agency model is the most scalable way to sell your services. So if you want to learn how to productize your agency, go to wgmyacademy.io and start the productized agency playbook course today. In this program, we show you step by step all of the systems and by the end of it you will have a fully productized agency ready to go and you'll be ready to accept payments so if you want to learn how to start a productized agency go to wgmiacademy.io and get signed up today yeah yeah 
I would say, you know, Iraq is kind of the creator example that I'll use is we helped, you know, their team early in Iraq, Iraq, the YouTuber, YouTuber career, career now. Um, and so they, uh, we got connected with them. I would say like maybe early 2021. Um, and they were basically in a pickle where they like had set their launch date. Um, I guess they, they did, they didn't need something at the time that was like, you know, pretty like fast like they needed to get this up like what was what were they trying to create creator now? yeah so it's basically like a cohort for creators right so it's a way to um you know people that are looking to create videos and you know become a youtuber to go through this like six week six week incubator where every week there's a challenge and then they you know we connected to the youtube api so that we're able to actually verify that they complete those challenges with and post mm. videos and so they already set the launch date um I think the reason they chose Bubble is one, the speed and also the cost. I think like just like any company, like you don't have infinite resources. They have money to start. Mm -hmm. But um, so we got connected. We ended up like scrapping together that like first thing. And literally, I think we had two weeks. It was like it was like you guys need to like come in and save the day kind of thing. Um, and so we did that. I think they were pretty impressed with what we did. And then it ended up us, you know, kind of redesigning it, rebuilding it again and then supporting them for, you know, probably six-ish months before they um, raised a bunch of money and kind of started scaling, scaling. So it was this basically a software app for other YouTubers. Airac is a big YouTuber, like one of the biggest, literally. Right. Yeah. And he was hosting a challenge if people wanted to get a lot of, subs like basically who can get the most subscribers or most views yeah. in a certain amount. And so you wanted to create like a custom course platform, but also verify their performance. So you connect it to YouTube's API to yeah. guarantee the views and the subscribers. Exactly, yeah. And there's other features like communicating yeah, and challenges, leaderboards yeah. and all of that. Exactly. And yeah. you had two weeks to build that in bubble. Yeah. I mean, we, we had like a little bit of a base to work with cause they like tried with some like devs and it was like, mm. we, so we had some like wireframes kind of thing, but it really, we had to like rebuild a lot of, a lot of what they had and then rethink it. Um, I think we even like completely redid the designs in like a week. Um, and so, yeah, if Career Now wasn't even just an experiment too. Like this was like a startup that they like, you know, now they have, you know, millions of dollars behind them and, you know, or have investors. So um, they really need something that would also like scale and be able to like, you know, iterate fast. So they kind of just hired you guys because they were in a pinch and they needed to move quickly and yeah. prove the concept. Yeah, exactly. And Bubble, like that's literally the best way to use Bubble right now right. is just make a very quick MVP and see if there's demand for it. Exactly. It's exactly yeah. what we're doing. So that's really cool to hear. Okay, but you're some, so I feel like I wanna kind of make this clear because you're gonna come off as like some really, really intelligent, another 20 year old wonder kid. It's like the theme yeah. of this podcast now where you're making $150,000 a month at 20 years old and you're a software developer in people's minds. So they're probably gonna classify you as like this kid genius, another Mark Zuckerberg who, whatever, figured out how to code in his college room and is gonna be a billionaire. And they will think that you, they, they will use that to like separate themselves from you. Like, oh, we just wanna, they'll put you in that group yeah. and then think it's not possible for them. Yeah. Talk, touch on that. Yeah, I would say, I mean, it's crazy that like literally three years ago, I was in high school. Like I was sitting in the back of my class on my laptop while my teachers were teaching whatever they were teaching. And I would just be like lasered on my laptop. Um, and I think a lot of people, I just hated school. Like I just, I just didn't understand why I was there. I wasn't learning anything I enjoyed. I didn't think that the path it led to was one that I would enjoy. And so there was definitely a period of like really like needing to figure that out. And so as I kind of said, like, Throughout my high, throughout high school, I was going from like drop shipping, affiliate marketing, um, SMMA. Uh, I did real estate, you know, videos. I, I literally hustled like every year was a different business, you know, um, and nothing was working. Like nothing really like clicked. Like I was lucky to make a thousand dollars like in a week. But the, by the way, like not a thousand dollars every week, like one thousand dollars, like one week, and then I'd make it again maybe mm -hmm. in like two months. So it was very much like. It, fe it felt like early success at the time because, you know, if you make, you know, $1,000 as like a 15 year old, it's like, whoa, you buy a lot of stuff. But then you realize <laughs> like you probably can't live off that. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's like, there was a real like ticking time bomb for me um, because, you know, my parents didn't want me to not go to school. Um, my grandparents didn't want me to not go to school. My friends, parents even commented on it. I remember being in the car with one of my friends um moms and she's like so what's your plan after school and I was like well I don't think I'm gonna go to school and she's like 
basically long story short she's basically like well that's a horrible idea like what are you gonna do you're gonna be a failure like and i'm like maybe hopefully not <laughs> um and so i think that i would i'd be surprised if there wasn't like a lot of people that are in that in that position like of like what do i need to do i have a lot of pressure on me from all these outside perspectives and i just need something to work um and you're probably trying a lot of different things um i would say <laughs> for me what was really a mindset shift um was i think you need to stop worrying about how to make money and just worry about like how to give value to people and how to do something you actually like because even if you like are doing something you really like and you're making like you know little to no money if you enjoy every waking moment you'll find a way to make money out of it and so for me this was like software and this was no code and that ultimately i, I got in at a good time um as far as like where no code played into and it's still a really great time right now like it's still very early right now is the good time yeah like it's not like this, this isn't one of those things where it's like commoditized yeah like this this is like you know i'm talking like two years ago you're the only person i could find on this topic right. by the way like i looked for so many people yeah and so i want to make that clear so i would say you know for me that was that's what clicked and i'm sure for a lot of people that could be the thing to click too because I think it is such a big opportunity and it is so accessible. Like never before could you literally like build a software business with like zero dollars to your name. Like that's, I mean, sure you could code it, but like that's going to take a, a really long time. Um, and now with the power of TikTok and, and, and short form, like if you're going to like spend all your time marketing something and building a brand, you might as well do it for something that has like infinite scale, as you said. So I, I was like in... The people that are watching this, like I was like very much in your shoes, like probably like, you know, 24 months ago. Um, and then something and it works and you start building on it. You know, as, as, as we said, like you take one thing, you reinvest, you do it again, you do it again and you just keep going until hopefully it never stops. Um, and so this, this isn't about intelligence business as I'm sure anybody will tell you is like 90% common sense. Mm -hmm. It's 90% like, okay, like what would, anyone what do. should i do now yeah, what should i do yeah. now yeah like if, if, if you think there's some like magical like someone's gonna tell tell me how to get started and walk me through every step of the way it's just not gonna happen like people i think the number one question i get is how did you start mm -hmm. like why did you like 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 how, how did you build this and because most people look at it it's like holy shit like they, they 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 look at where i am now and they see zero right and that's a big that's a big thing but if you look at it as like i'm at zero how can i get to like you know, zero dollars a month, let's say, how can I get to a hundred dollars a month? Exactly. That's, that's much more manageable. So it's like, you, you got to like treat it more like broken down like that. Nobody starts a billion dollar company thinking how to build a billion dollar company because billion dollar companies operate very differently than $10,000 a month companies and hundred million dollar companies. So being in that like framework and that, that way of like thinking is, is really important. Um, and fall, falling into something that you actually enjoy. Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I agree with this 100%. Yeah. I think a lot of people are, but they're in a situation of like survival. Like yeah. they need to make like $2,000 this month or like they won't pay their rent or yeah. they're in a really bad family situation. So they yeah. don't, I feel like they don't like hearing that. Yeah, yeah. But I, but fall in love with the act of working on a business yeah. and trying to make money with it. Because I had the same story as you. I tried SMMA. I tried drop shipping. But for like these like three months, six months stints of my life, I can say I tried it. Yeah. But you, that doesn't like convey the visceral vivid experience I was going through for three months trying drop shipping and yeah. learning all these skills. And so you have to try something, you learn a universal skill. You try SMA, you learn the sales skill. Yeah. Oh, you try affiliate marketing, you learn the ad skill. And yeah. you're learning these skills and then you finally stumble into something that you actually like doing. Exactly. You stick with it a little longer and you've stuck with or and you've attained those skills, then it clicks for people. Yeah. No, that's exactly like drop shipping. I lost money. I think every other business I like basically Me lost too. money. <laughs> like nobody, you like, really, yeah, people make money in drop shipping, but they also really, the people that make money in drop shipping are the people that have a knack for one aspect of the business. I think probably mm -hmm. is like one big one is creatives. Like they're really good at TikTok. Mm -hmm. you know, you've seen that. You had Oliver Tab Chocolate Guy on. Like he's got really good at creating videos and he probably really enjoyed that. And so. The business did well. That's not even drop shipping, though. That's just yeah. I guess not, right? Oh, I he, guess it is. It's third party. He has a third party logistics company, so he's not. Yeah, I mean, I'm not even saying drop shipping. I'm just saying e-commerce. E-commerce. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> but basically, it's 
that's the point is like, what are, what do you naturally gravitate towards? I just naturally gravitate towards content. Like yeah. I like making videos. Right. That was my first business was videos. Yeah. And I like teaching people stuff. I'm always teaching all my friends the business shit that I was doing. And so yeah. like, that's a natural fit for me to make content. Brandon, complete opposite. He loves analyzing software companies and figuring out how they made it work. What did they connect? And so he has a knack for just figuring out and solving a problem like it's a puzzle where I could never sit down and like even for 10 minutes do that. And so it's really coming down to learning these different skills through trying a million things. And then once you try eight things, you're like, you know what? I actually liked try number three. Yeah. Let me stick with that through a long time. Yeah. Because you, that's the hardest part for people is every business model works. It's just, are you good enough to make it work right now? Exactly. And it's usually typically because you're undereducated and underexperienced. Yeah. So, but that's why it's so cool to hear your story because you're like one of the first people to figure out this whole bubble agency and then building software on top of it. Like you have such the right, most high leverage strategy from the fact that you're 20 that holy shit, what's going to happen in the next 10 years for you. Yeah. It's so cool. Yeah. Now, what about other clients? What about like your more enterprise clients let's say yeah yeah i mean i can't i can't say names just of course NDAs, no, I know, but I um i would say you know a lot of our better clients we're seeing a big push towards internal tools um salesforce uh, for people or you know other crms a lot of times don't cut it for these like really you know either like specific organizations or you know have complex workflows and so we're seeing a lot of fortune 500 companies reach out to build these like super sometimes simple sometimes complex internal tools um, the benefit with no code is like one, they don't want to put like millions of dollars behind it because it is just an internal tool. Um, also we're able to like build that fast and iterate fast because, you know, as the company changes, they need the tools to change. And so, um, that's kind of the use case that we're seeing and we're seeing it from like enterprise, like we're talking like media companies that we all know, you know, organizations that we watch and all that stuff to like medium, small businesses that are doing like one to $10 million a year in, in revenue. How do you choose how much to charge for these companies? Yeah, I mean, I would say our model has tend to be like fixed costs. So we, we really have like, you know, building a scope of like defining like what we need in this product. I think a lot of times people can get like carried away also with that first build. And so we help them try to narrow in what, what is the most important. And then um, from there, it's like, okay, how long is this going to take? Um, what, are we, what do we need as far as integrations? Uh, and then we just put a price to it and go at it. Okay, so is this is using Bubble like a competitive advantage? Like, are you able to charge less than a traditional dev agency because you're using Bubble, and that's why you're able to get these like very big clients, basically? Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, to give you an example, like, I mean, a, a company that probably everyone knows. I'm not saying we work with them, but Airbnb. Okay, mm -hmm. so if you were to go build Airbnb traditional dev today, you're probably assuming you have to go hire an agency. I mean, maybe if you're a really good dev and you can do it yourself, it's a different story. But if you go to hire an agency, you're probably looking at at least a six month timeline. You're probably looking at at least you know two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And so to do that same thing with us or another agency, you're probably looking at like maybe two months, and then you're probably looking at like under fifty k. So it's just mm. like drastically different, right? Mm. And you're probably one of the first people to really figure out this agency model because it's interesting like you're as an agency you're not the one doing the bubble work at this point like yeah. if you're doing 150k a month you can't possibly do that yourself so you yeah. are hiring bubble devs yeah and so there's no difference in hiring a bubble dev than hiring a like a normal full stack dev yeah. right so it's yeah. like you're specifically choosing this and this is giving you a competitive advantage right. or the point that you're a 20 year old working with the biggest brands in the world because you can do the exact same thing they're looking for way cheaper, way faster because you discover no code tools. Right. So this is like an arbitrage opportunity because it's a new opportunity. Yeah, no, for sure. And I, I would say like no code is like just getting started. Like we're, you know, as the space gets bigger, I think like people are putting out reports that like even internal tools, right? Like internal tools is just one sector of like where no code could play in. And that is like getting drastically bigger every year. Organizations are spending billions of dollars. And so even if you can tap into like a tiny fraction of that and help you have a really big opportunity um and i think a lot of these companies are getting sick of like the the sales forces of the world the oracles of the world that just like relentlessly charge them like hundreds of thousand dollars a month and so it's a really easy opportunity to be like look we'll build you something cheaper it'll be way nicer it'll be you know faster all this stuff and specific and specific to your business and by the way it's like 20k not like two million for one like for one off payment yeah yeah, yeah. It's a no-brainer. And I think, so online, in the online world, 
all YouTubers like me, Iman, Sebastian, whatever, we're teaching these make money online opportunities. Yeah. But I think it's because they're easy to imagine. They're easy to understand. Okay, drop shipping. I need to pick a product. I can sell it. And I can tell my friends I have a t-shirt company. Or I can tell my friends I sell this toy. Right. And so people gravitate towards that. And especially younger people where it's really cool that you're a younger person and you understand like all the money is B2B with these big companies and solving problems for them. And so you're building software that's 10 times cheaper than the Salesforce options. And you're building custom solutions for these. But an 18 year old who hasn't had experience in that world just doesn't know that exists. Right. So how did you like figure that out? And then how did you get your foot in the door with these people? Yeah, I mean, I think in my experience, it's like you kind of like learn as you do, right? And, and learn as you go kind of thing. So, you know, as business would come to us, I would just see use cases, you know, come time after time that were very similar, right? CRMs is a big one, um, but there's just a bunch of others that just keep coming up. And you were starting with like a small company and then they just had like a problem and you're like, huh, I used this, I used this tool bubble in high school, so I can just maybe use bubble again for this company. Right. And then you started to realize that these, all of these companies higher up the chain have the same type of internal problems. Right. Right. And so was it more just word of mouth? Cause you like worked all the way up to the chain, up the chain. So I'm so curious, like how did you go from a local Taekwondo company yeah. to Iraq, <laughs> then to an enterprise fortune 500 company? Like, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I think one people would be surprised by the power of like, just, you know, one person works at X company, then moves to X company. They take your tool over to that company. Well, some of our biggest enterprises, like that's how we got them. Like maybe an employee or a VP at like a mid-level enterprise went to this like Fortune 500 company and they're like, wow, we really liked what you did. Let's do it here. And so from that perspective, it's like what people need to realize for B2B is that at the end of the day, you're working with people. And so it's still the same like benefits that you need to sell. It's the same. You still are like selling on emotion because at the end of the day, like I think people think of B2B as like this, like, oh, you got to attack this organization. And like but ultimately, like you, you are you are selling a person. Right. And there is this person on the other end of the you know business or the other end of the line that is driving that in in that company. Right. So um, just using people that we you know have worked with and you know expanding our network has really been that that main way we've done that. How do you, how, like, literally, how do you find them? Like, are you, like, going to networking events? Are you, like, in online communities and you're just, you see someone say, hey, are you on LinkedIn? Like, yeah. what are you, like, how are you getting this, your name out there or in the mix of these opportunities? At yeah. the start, especially. At the start, yeah. I mean, a lot of it is, like, yeah, just hustling, right? Like, I think people will be surprised how far you can get with a good cold email campaign. Yeah, mm -hmm. as I'm sure, like, you know, mm -hmm. like, you, you set up, like, an Apollo sequence you know, go after a hundred people in the industry, um, you know, business owners, and you, you, you go after a very specific problem that they have, like, you're not going to get all of them respond, but maybe 10, five, and mm -hmm. you go from there. Right. Um, and so a lot of it's that events, just networking, um, and now content's like a big thing. I think that's where everything's heading. So, you know, trying to build personal brand blogs, all that stuff. So essentially if you were like literally starting from scratch, you would just set up a cold email campaign on Apollo are you targeting, a spe would you target any specific industry or would you just target like a type of person? Like how are you sourcing Apollo cold outreach? Yeah, I mean, there's there's many ways to go about it. it. It depends like what stage you're at. I would say if you're starting from scratch and you want to create a SaaS, you know, let's say $10,000 a month SaaS, I would say first pick, pick a local demographic as in like the city that you live in. It's easy to like be able to connect with people on that level. Like, hi, I'm from X city, right? right? And then I would say, pick a, you know, pick some kind of industry that you're somewhat passionate about and that you somewhat understand. And if you don't, like, go research what those industries are. Um, and then, you know, I would also say start with a comp. Don't go for the big fish. Like, go for, like, the smallest fish mm -hmm. you can. Go for the restaurants. Go for the local, you know, barber shops. Like, those people have problems. And maybe they won't pay, like, millions of dollars for them. But they may pay, like, a couple hundred dollars a month for them, right? And then from there, you, you're like, okay, this, is, this works. What, now how can I go to a bigger business and do the same thing? So it's almost like you could get a job at a restaurant and then just like look around and be like, there's a very big pain point here with payroll. They have right. to do payroll manually. They have right. to count all the cash, hand it out. Yeah. And you're like, huh, I could just go home and tinker on bubble and figure out a way to make this a little exactly. easier for them. Exactly. And then say, hey, I built this. Would this help you as a manager? They say, yes, charge them a hundred bucks a month. Now you can just go sell that to every single restaurant one by one and just yeah. put their branding on it exactly. basically. Yeah, yeah. And I would say like the big advantage is like 
before you couldn't do that because like, I mean, you gotta know how to code um, or you're gonna go hire a dev. And so that's just not, po- that just wasn't possible. But now it's like anybody that wants to like maybe take a couple of weeks to go learn bubble can go build anything like that in probably a matter of you know, another couple of weeks. And so you're gonna see a lot of these like niche B2B SaaS companies that are probably scaling you know, pretty locally, but like doing anywhere from like ten to $100,000 a month pretty quickly because they're solving a very specific problem. Um, and, you know, they're not trying to become the sales person of the right. world. They're not trying to solve everyone's problem um, at every company says. If you can solve one problem really specifically, charge even like $100 a month to these businesses, like they're doing like this problem is going to, you know, for the payroll example, if that's going to save them, you know, maybe it's like mismanaging payrolls. Who knows? Like mm-hmm. maybe that's the issue. If that's going to save them maybe $5,000 a month and like miss payments or whatever it is, and you're going to offer them a solution for $200 a month, that's a big win for them. And it's a big win for you. It doesn't make sense for Salesforce to make a very niche restaurant, pizza restaurant cash tip right. feature into yeah. their CRM. They're trying to serve a broad market. Exactly. And so Bubble allows anyone to come in and solve hyper-focused problems. Yeah. And you can easily make $10,000 a month even maybe $50,000 a month with one of these softwares. And you really just have to solve it for one local business, get your in, and then now you're just focused on the cold outreach to get more and more sales, which is really easy to do with AI tools and Apollo. Like cold outreach is a lot, it it takes some work, but it's not rocket science. But I will say you are very articulate and that is pretty important. Like I think a lot of people have a limiting belief, like, oh, I'm only 18, I'm 19. Like, how do I, is that going to be a problem? Has nothing to do with your age. It's like, if you send a cold email and you convince them to get on a call with you, are you believable? Do they trust that you actually know what you're doing and you can execute on them if you're asking for money? But if you have that first example of the restaurant, it's proof right there. As long as you can like make them believe that you made that, you should be able to close the deal, no problem. Right. And I, I just want to say, like, obviously, I'm maybe slightly articulate now, but like, it was not like that. Like I would literally get on calls. First off, camera off because I didn't want them to see I was seventeen or whatever. <laughs> yeah. right? I, I think for, I think for the first two years of my company, I had turned my camera on. One and minute. they gave you ten to thousand yeah. dollars. I mean, you know, I had eventually I hired a salesperson to take those calls. Uh-huh. Um, and so, you know, pretty quickly I learned like delegation is obviously a big part of business. And so, I I think after that first build, I never did another build again. Really? Yeah. So you just took that money. So you you could leverage the next deal and get paid up front and then just use the money for that closed deal to hire the bubble dev. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, okay, it's a positive cash flow cycle, right? So, you know, and a a lot of agencies that are set up, right, have that, where it's like you get the money before you actually do the work. Mm. Um, So that means, like, you don't need any money to start, like, literally. Um, And so people always ask me, like, how do you get started? Like, how do you get the money to get started? Like, there's no trick to it. You know what I mean? Like, you just... You just start. It's very straightforward. You see that they have a problem. You say, hey, I can solve you this problem. Would this help you? Yes. Okay, it's going to cost like $5,000 for the whole scope of work. Pay me that and I'll get it done. And then you as an agency founder, your job was to get that deal. Now you just are responsible for getting it fulfilled, but you can pay a bubble dev 1,500 bucks and just pocket 3,500. Then take that 3,500, hire a salesperson and multiply. Exactly. That's all it was. Yep. Your salesperson is now just dealing with inbound then. Yep. Okay, so how are you getting the inbound? Yeah, I mean, just like um, referrals are a big one, right? Um, RFPs, so that those are like RFPs are requests for proposals. So these are like systems that you can find pretty much, there's a bunch of them, um, that you can go and basically sign sign up for. And what will happen is, is bas- they basically um, create a big, it's like if, if any company is like, I want to f- hire software developers, but they don't know where they'll look, they, these RFP websites will basically like filter like all the kind of the best places. I mean, they're, they're like, there's marketplaces, right? Which is like, um, you know, five or Upwork. Those are just marketplaces, but RFPs are, it basically stands for request for um, proposal or request for bid. Um, and so basically you can just get a bunch of these companies. They're like, we want to build this for X budget. And then you'll have a bunch of agencies competing on that bid. Right. Um, so we just got really good at winning those. Um, and so we built a whole process of like, first you gotta hit them first, then you gotta you know, really walk them through a really nice process of like what they're gonna get. Um, and so we started winning a lot through that. And then it's just reinvesting those into, you know, then eventually ad spend comes in, you know, actually running ads. 
content. Okay, so I want to go deep on this RFP thing because I've never heard of this before. Yeah. So it's request for proposal and they're just websites. What are the websites? I mean, most, like Bubble has one, Webflow I think has one. Most of these like companies, I think Salesforce has one. They all kind of have these RFPs. And they're basically mm. like, you know, instead of going to each individual agency and trying to request a, a bid, you just go to like this one place, request a bid. So is this what you mean by you're a verified bubble agency? Right, right. RFP. Okay. How did you become a verified bubble agency? Um, I think you. I think anyone can sign up to get these RFPs. Um, there, there are now tiers in place. So it's like gold, silver, and that's just based on um, how much work you do and client success and that, and that kind of stuff. But um, anyone can sign up and just do it. If you get an RFP yeah. and you want to get that deal, what are you saying to them? Yeah. So, I mean, first it's like time to response is a big thing. So you got to be like quick, right? Like, and you know, we have ways of kind of hacking that system, but how, I mean, we started playing around with automations. Um, so you made your own software to win RFPs. More like a, just like a Zapier kind yeah, of Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, then people started catching on to that pretty quick. Mm -hmm. um, both clients and other agencies started doing it. So then now it's just like, you got to be personalized now. I think the world is, um, I see a lot of people, entrepreneurs talk about like the, how SDR strategy is dying. Basically like the cold email strategy, like it can get you to a certain point, but ultimately like people are kind of numb to it as far as like the consumers, right? People get hit on their email every day, their texts, their, you know, mailers, whatever it is. Like they're just getting hit everywhere nonstop. And so it's really hard to stand out in an inbox that's filled with like 10 emails that were also sent that same hour. And so um, that's why being personalized and going back to the RP, like that is a big thing. Like how, how do I actually like respond in a way that like makes them see that we thought about what they said, you know what I mean? And so from there, it's like, then it's like, okay, cool. We can help you. Here's what we do. Giving some social proof of like who we are. Um, and then link to our calendar to schedule a call. Okay. So it's like just looking, taking 15 minutes to see what the company's all about. Yep. Making sure you deeply understand what they want. Yep. Speaking to that in the message. And then just making sure they very well can see that you're credible. You've worked with other companies. Yep. Look at what you built before. And then just hop on a call. Yep. Then it's just sales call, right. basically. And that's what your salesperson is doing. Right. And that's basically just what they're doing all day, every day. Just ready for those RFPs, yep. doing the personalized outreach. I would say, what is like the expected lead time? So say that you get on one of these calls with these people. From that first call to closing the deal, sending them your scope of work, getting and then receiving money. How long yeah. is that typically? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the company size, but I would say... You're probably like a good deal will close in two to four weeks, but you know, enterprise will close in many months. <laughs> yeah. Many months. Yeah. yeah. I get that. Okay. So two to four weeks for like a typical mid-sized company from an RFP on the bubble marketplace. So are you charging all up front, half and half? What is your typical yeah. structure? It's usually, it used to be half and half. We're leaning in towards like the monthly model now, um, going towards more of the productized service of just charging a monthly rate and you know, kind of getting access to our team. Um, but yeah, half and half is kind of typical. Why do you want to go? We do the monthly, right? Yeah. So why are you interested in that specifically? I would say just it's just the way that things are moving. Um, I mean, you obviously look at SaaS, right? SaaS has basically did the monthly rate for, you know, Spotify did it for iTunes, right? Um, it's basically because people don't want to worry about, like, if they want more, they just want to eat. They don't want to worry about, it's the same as like a, yeah, all you can eat buffet. That's, that's the genius of it is that if people want more, they pay the one fee and they just go eat all they want. And it's the same thing for Spotify. It's the same thing for Netflix. If you don't we want to watch a movie, you just pay this, the fee, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's the same thing. It's like businesses want that too. They don't want to worry about, oh, if I have to add this, then it's going to be this much. So if we can, you know, estimate roughly how much it's going to, time, time it's going to take, um, um, then we're able to, you know, roughly price, like, this is what's going to cost monthly, but we're flexible with it. Like, you kind of just get access to a dev, a designer, a PM, and for that, you kind of just can work in what they can handle, in, you know, every month, basically. We have found it to be probably the best win-win right. situation for most of these companies, because we're only working with companies who make probably around a million dollars a month in revenue, maybe 500000 a month in revenue, so there are, they can afford, like, it's basically like you get a full development team for the price of one employee, yeah. and on top of that, you get 
anything you want built. And yeah. so typically with a dev agency, it's like you work with three agencies for three independent scopes. You don't get anything until the third month. With the monthly process, you're basically just building them piece by piece as they go. Exactly, they yeah. can pause and start. And on top of that, in theory, they're always going to need you, whether it's upkeep for the app, whether it's more features. So it's like you're actually building a relationship with these people. And so I've seen it. It's done us very well, very quickly, which I've been surprised for. So yeah, it does make sense. That that's where most people are going. And the async communication is yeah. like Saves time. so much better. Yeah. So it makes a lot of sense. Okay. So that's your agency. Yeah. What, what's it called, by the way? Crem Digital. Yeah. How do you spell it? C-R-E-M-E Digital. Crem Digital. Awesome. Go check it out. Yeah. If you want software built, you have a plug. Yeah. Now's the time. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> www.crem.digital. Um, my you know, Instagram is it's Crem. And uh, yeah. Okay. And then Jacob Clug. Yeah. Jacob Clug at jacob.clug. Uh, on TikTok, Instagram, Jacob S. Clark. Okay, cool. So you're crushing it. That's, again, I want to just recap people, but it is relatively that straightforward. Like yeah. Bubble is basically like Shopify. Just if you can make a Shopify drag and drop store, you can figure out how to make Bubble software. He did it in two weeks for his first app. It's not rocket science, okay? So you can figure out how to build these softwares really easily. There's templates. And then from there, you just need to go find a business with a problem that makes sense tinker, get it built and offer it to them. And if they want to pay for it, then hit the ground running, start building those for other companies and then become a verified bubble agency. You're going to get these proposals and you try to win the bid. Okay. And so that's just going to take practicing that muscle of sending an offer, making yourself sound credible, practicing sales. But again, not rocket science. If you can articulate their problem and make it clear to them that you can solve it, they're going to sign up with you. Okay. Yeah. So what is a range for by the way, I was going to say, what is the range for one of these RFPs, like pricing wise? Like, how are you figuring out that price? Is it based on hours that you think it'll take for devs, basically? Yeah, basically, it's just like, if it's a fixed scope, it's just like, how long it's going to take? And then we just put a number to hours, yeah. And you just gotten an eye for that now, and since you've had the reps, how yeah. much is a bubble dev? Kind of ranges. I mean, we have them on like retainers, right? So it's just kind of, you, but you can get them pretty cheap cheap if you're just hiring a you know freelancer maybe like 30 50 an hour kind of thing right so you know one thing i didn't kind of mention is like when we entered the space i think people have the stigma around no code that's like ugly janky products right that it's like you go in it like barely works you know it won't scale past you know a couple hundred users even you know tens of thousands of users i think that used to be true where products did kind of suck like design people people didn't understand it because in any like space you're always going to get like the you know the extremist the nerds mm -hmm. that kind of take, take it for us <laughs> and those guys don't know design you know if, to save their life and so my thing was like the gap and the reason that i went into the space was like how can we actually make bubble products that people like using i think we, we live in a time where user experience and ui you know how a product looks and feels is so important um if you have a great idea, but your product looks like shit, people are just not going to want to come back to it, right? And so, um, though getting MVP fast and you know efficiently and you know costly uh, is important, it's also important that it looks good. And so that was our kind of thing. Is like, yeah, we'll charge a little bit more to get that like design you know touch to it, but ultimately like you're gonna the outcome is gonna be like way better, mm -hmm. right? So that that's kind of where Bubble is now, where you know. There's a lot of components, libraries, and a lot of like, you know, easy Figma kind of integrations mm -hmm. that you can use to like actually build really nice products. That's the craziest thing to me is that you can literally just make a Figma and then just connect it to bu Bubble and then just connect the buttons yeah. and it works. Yeah. Like it's not like you have to like match it and make it yourself. It's yeah. like you literally import it, then connect the buttons. Like it blows my mind. Like yeah. I feel like I have a superpower. It's like anything that I want built, I just tell my partner and it gets built in a week yeah and that's not normal like yeah. we had a traditional dev agency for years yeah. and now i can snap my fingers and stuff is done and it looks really good because of the figma side of right. no code just right. being able to pl plug it in right i don't know how else to express my excitement for this but it's so damn cool and such yeah. a big opportunity so you're crushing that and of course design matters people i think people would be surprised i'm not a technical person at all but i think people would be surprised that most software is just like a Google sheet database and very, like it's not very complicated and you just add a nice little front end, make it look pretty. Right. It's like literally taking a Google sheet, but making it look better. Yeah, and then make automations are the, fl like it's like Zapier and a Google sheet, 
but with a nice front, pretty design. That's all most softwares are. And it seems so complicated when you're not a technical person, but sorry. Yeah, Side tangent. Great, I'm coming to that revolution. It's a, great, it's a great way to put it. And that's why you're seeing businesses come to it, right? Because mm-hmm. like, what do business run off? Excel, spreadsheets, right? And Zapier. And like, Zapier, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's like now you can just build it. That's software. I, okay, I'm going to say it one more time. That's all most of our software is. It's just Zapier, Google Sheets. If you can do that as an agency for other companies, all you're doing is just changing the way it looks now. So that's the back end. And the right. front end is the Figma design, which is just instead of going to four different tabs, you just click a button and then next page, click a button, next page. Yeah. And it's all just one designed flow. I guess it's the simplest way to put it. But you're killing it, 150 grand a month, bubble dev agency. I think this is kind of a big point where you have to decide, do you really want to scale up the agency to like dozens and dozens of people? Right. Or do you just want to keep this as a cash flowing machine and maybe go into a different opportunity? So what's your plan yeah. from here? Yeah, I would say, you know, agencies are great to a certain point. They're great cash flow businesses, but they are not meant to like scale to, you know, past probably what we're doing now. I would say like once you get to, you know, let's say five-ish million a year uh, in revenue, you're probably best going something more scalable um, because we need to understand about agencies. This is for SMA. This is also for drop shipping and any real like, you know, company where like there's physical, you know, goods required or there's people associated with it, especially for agencies is that for every deal that we get, there is a, you know, expense already built into that. that you know, if it's dev hours, if it's, you know, hiring new designers, hiring new project managers, like we know what we're going to make every every deal which is good but it means that like ultimately to grow to let's say the next you know 100 million dollar agency you're going to need a company that's about a thousand people Mm -hmm. like literally um and so and the same with drop shipping right like it's like if you want to scale well then you need to you know you know your expenses like you know that like you have to fulfill it you have ad spend like for every deal um or for every uh, purchase you're getting on that website you basically already know what the profit is on that and so you know, dropshipping is a little more scalable than agencies because it really is just about adjusting that knob on the ad spend or whatever your, you know, your creatives are. Um, I would say what I believe is like really like the ultimate when uh, obviously being in the software space is like launching our own, you know, software is these micro SaaS products. Um, and so basically the playbook that like I was kind of, we just chatted around, like going to these businesses and like helping them is basically the playbook that we're starting to run now of just um, building these micro SaaSs that we don't necessarily sell as like, we can do this for you. We sell it as like, we have a product ready to go. Um, and uh, it's not just like businesses, like obviously there's like the B2C side. So just like, building cool apps that I think are cool. Um, and basically building like a, a venture studio, a no code venture studio is the end goal. A no code venture studio. Yeah. Okay, so you're basically, you're taking the money from your agency and you're taking that money to build software that you see as a problem. Yeah. Are you charging these companies for the software, like, yeah. as like a, so it's like almost like an agency client, but then you're building it for them. And then you're like, wait, if this is a product that the restaurant wants, I can actually productize it exactly. and sell it as a SaaS. Exactly. So I want to make that distinction. You're building a software as an agency for your agency client. Yeah. But then you see that idea and you're like, I can productize it and build a software as a service for much cheaper. Right. So you're probably charging them like 10, 20 grand, but then you're going to charge a hundred, hundred dollars a month once you've generalized it for every restaurant in that exactly. niche that's your thought process exactly. okay and then from there you're doing that for a few companies a few opportunities that you can see you can manage multiple right but from there you're looking to start a venture studio yeah explain that because i've heard that word a lot lately yeah i mean a venture studio is basically a company with its sole purpose of creating other companies um mm. so it's basically you incubate you know one company and usually you have a process of like how you do that right so it's like first you have your ideation phase then you obviously build it and launch it and so the goal is to have a portfolio of you know a bunch of these softwares that are generating basically you know passive monthly you know revenue because ultimately like the agency is cool like it's 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 cool to what we've gone into you know the cash is is nice and they are relatively profitable if you're able to manage it well but ultimately like to take an agency you know from where we are now to again you know maybe nine figures eight figures whatever it is um that just requires so much scale. Um, and software, obviously, is like for every person you get, there's no real cost to that. So it's really just a marketing you know, game. Um, and I think that like you also look at the multiples that software sell. If you have a software that does 
let's say a hundred thousand dollars a month, so one point two million a year. You can bet that if you if that business is like strong enough and the metrics are there, you could probably go ahead and sell that company for a five to ten x on revenue, where an agency sells for you're you're lucky to get one x revenue, mm-hmm. right? So there's a big difference there. Like, would you rather have a hundred million dollar exit, maybe even a billion dollar exit, if you have a bunch of these softwares that are doing like you know one million dollars a year, or would you rather like have that agency or drop shipping thing where it's like it's tied to people. It's, um, you know, very much, like, not as, like, profitable as SaaS. And the, the long-term exit strategy just isn't there. It's the era of leverage. Right. And now with no code tools, it's, like, double leverage. I don't know how to describe it. But if you can make content, infinite leverage because you can get millions of views after yeah. making one piece of video. If you can make software, infinite leverage because you make the product once. Obviously, you're going to continue to improve it. But you make the product once, you can get 1,000 customers without any extra costs really. Right. And so these are the two most high leverage things that you can create. And so with your agency, it's a little more friction because you have to hire more people. You have yeah. to get another salesperson. If you want to scale, it's very linear. Yeah. And so you're using that to make money to then fund your venture studio. And this could be bringing in other entrepreneurs who have ideas that don't have the cash flow that you have. This could be bringing in an entrepreneur with distribution, like making content, and you guys will do the back end, and you guys bring a 50-50 deal because he's going to do the marketing, you're going to build it. But the engine is the agency that's making you money, right. all these developers you have in your pipeline. So you have a dev agency that can just make any of these softwares fast, yeah. and then these people with distribution can go ahead and pump it out, and you can validate the idea super quickly. Yeah. So instead of building, spending six months on one idea, hoping it works, yeah. you're just doing these little micro bets with your team and then partnering with the right people. Yeah. That's yeah. the concept. Yeah. And another thing is like, I know like people are going to comment like no code isn't scalable, no code, like devs, like all this stuff. Like there, there is a point, right? Like if you're trying to build the next Instagram or Facebook or Uber, don't build on no code. I mean, start, like I think no code is a, is a great, probably the best like validation prototyping kind of tool to get to your first, even, even a thousand users. Like people would be surprised, you know, it takes a bit of time to get those first users. Right. But once you do, then it kind of goes, um, so, you know, I'm not saying that like there isn't a world where no code and traditional dev can live together. I think there absolutely is. I think traditional dev still has its place. You know, if you want to build those, you know, tens of millions of users, it's just no code won't cut it. Um, but I think if you want to get to even, you know, $10,000 a month, $100,000 a month where, you know, you're looking at maybe a lot, like under 5,000 people that are using it, you're more than, that, that's more than enough, right? And the cool thing about Bubble is that you can hard code into it. Yeah, like exactly. Bubble is almost just like more plug and front play. end focus, anyways, right? Yeah, like Bubble is like super plug and play, right? So, which means that you can basically like yeah build that front end and then comp- like you know connect any any external integration tool like you know Stripe obviously is the, the obvious one. So if you want to you know, collect payments, you just literally click a button and install the Stripe integration, um, and then you have like. Um, you can go even more crazy, which is like, you know, I know with some with some tools that really want to scale is they build a, you know, database and server that is completely custom code, powers the back end, and then um, basically they're able to then send that back to the bubble front end, um, and it's all hosted within bubble. It's still faster because you have that front end on bubble and you can iterate on it fast, but if if you're a technology company and the value of your company is we build this AI, right? AI, <laughs> you're basically building technology and that's what the value of the company is if you're open AI, for example, right? So the build on bubble would completely defeat the point, almost, because um, you are basically, you know, attaching the value to your company to um, a tool that is not owned by you. Um, but if you're able to then plug in an external database, that solves that problem, right? So you still get the speed and, you know, some some cost savings with the front end, but you can basically build anything and tap into it through an API. Yeah. It's like, if you want to include a calendar app in your software, why would you hard code a calendar app yeah. when you can use an API of Calendly or Google calendar and just use all of the decades of years of features they've built and just include that in your software? Like it doesn't make sense. And this only works now because so much software is available. So many APIs are available that you don't actually, it makes way less sense to code it than to just use an API. Yeah. And so if you, unless you are hard coding your own models, trying to create a brand new type of AI, then it doesn't make any sense to do anything other than just using APIs. 
yeah. correct? Yeah, totally. And now with AI APIs, you can yeah. just plug in their AI into your software and sell it as your own in a way. Yeah. And I think that's like one of the coolest opportunities because no company has that. And so you can go to any restaurant and say, hey, there are AI APIs that can take your to-go orders for you now. There are AI APIs that can talk to your customers directly. There are AI APIs that can transcribe every message so you can get customer feedback. Yeah. And so this is something that no restaurant has and every restaurant could use. So you could have a bubble dev agency that plugs in AI APIs and solve that problem, then productize it for everybody else. I have not shut up about this for the last year because it's, yeah. just, it's just so important and it's so much better than drop shipping or SMMA or any of those other make money online opportunities because you're learning real skills that provide real value that have actual infinite scale with leverage. Yeah. So I just, I just don't know why anyone would be doing anything else because now it's democratized. It's the great equalizer of software. Right. And, and the, you know, the exit strategy, the ac- to actually like someone, to someone to actually buy your company is, uh, is meaningful. Like what are you going to sell an SMA for? I mean, there's a reason that Iman's probably shut his agency down because they don't really sell. He's not, what is he going to make? Like, I mean, and then he still has the headaches of like going through the whole process um, of selling and, you know, moving his team, he's probably much better off just like doing exactly what he's doing, focusing on SaaS, you know, building agency flow, I think Educate he launched recently. So um, you kind of see like a lot of the creators in the space that used to be doing agencies or dropshipping where there is are going towards SaaS. And that's really where my like money is at as well as like, I believe that SaaS is like the ultimate kind of move right now. Um, and like you said, I think people also don't realize that all these AI companies are using the same API and there's a different front end and they're just tuning it a little bit, adding some like slight, like basically prompt engineering is what it is to like get a different output. That's all they are. And they're raising literally tens of millions of dollars every single day you see a new AI company. There's, there's no technology, just the front end. You're just solving a problem and you're like, it is such like a chat GPT. You can say anything into it, which is the problem. And yeah. so if you can systemize an order of prompts to get a specific output for a specific niche, then it's a very valuable product. Yeah. And the front, the, the front end is now the product. Yeah. Like that is all it is now. You're not doing anything technical, not creating anything new on the back end. You're just choosing the right sequence of tools to use and then designing a nice user experience. Yeah, exactly. It's so crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. I, I mean, the way I like to kind of explain it for people also is like what, what no code is, I would say in comparison to traditional dev. I like to use the analogy of like a PC, like a computer, right? So, I mean, I'm sure people, you know, a lot of people like building their own PCs. Um, the difference between like, I would say coding and, tr- and um, no code is that with traditional dev, a lot of times you're building those like those pieces that go into the PC, like your, your hard drive, your GPU, CPU. Those things usually mm-hmm. aren't built for you with, with traditional dev. You got it, like, as you said, like the calendar example, like these basic functionalities to have a feed. A lot of times you got to build that stuff. You got to build those bare bones functionality. With no code, it's like you already have those building blocks. So mm. I would use the comparison of like a PC. That's could, great. Yeah, you just tie in all the... So I can just buy an NVIDIA 4090 exactly. graphics card. I can just buy RAM. I can just buy a processor. Exactly. And then I can combine it however I want. Where yeah. you're saying that if you're actually wanting to code you have to make a graphics exactly. card yeah so nvidia is gone you have to make a cpu and right. which is just so dumb yeah but all these people still believe they're building their own pc and so that's yeah. probably the, i'm gonna use that now yeah. that's really good yeah i mean obviously like you know coding has frameworks and stuff like that too and obviously like not everything is from scratch but you know there are stuff like you know the easy integrations of just like using something else um, that you have with no code that I don't think is as accessible with traditional dev or they just tend not to go that way because you're, you know, you're building in traditional anyways. So I'm interested though that you say that because with AI now and GitHub Copilot, yeah. like a lot of code is like being AI generated. Yeah. And it seems like to the point where I think a lot of people are a little ahead of themselves, but they think that at some point you're just going to be able to like voice to code, like say, hey, build me a calendar app and it's going to get built. So yeah. do you see that being a threat to like bubble? Or like, do you see bubble like being like a short term window before that becomes the case? Or what's your perspective on that? Have you thought about that? But I've heard from like my developer friends, it's like GitHub is a great developer assistant. Basically allows like existing developers to develop a lot faster and just like help like with some basic like stuff that just normally take a lot of time. But ultimately you still need to know how to code. Like you still need to know what it's saying. It's gonna get stuff wrong. You know, you're gonna have to tweak it. It's a good base though. 
And so, you know, if you want to go down that route, um, it just takes it more of a learning curve, I think, to like really learn, you know, all these new frameworks. You, you have React, you have, you know, all these Python, JavaScript, JavaScript, whatever. Like you have all these things you need to learn um, and able to build like a functioning app a lot of the times. And yeah, you do have AI to help you, but I think you might as well like be able to know what you're actually doing um, and use tools that you can go and do it yourself, not really need help. Eventually AI, I think Bubble just actually just introduced Bubble AI. And mm. the, the, yeah, like last week they introduced Bubble AI. Do you think they could win the AI? Like that could be like their like... like they, it, will, it will definitely help. I think you kind of have like, you have traditional dev, kind of and and no code kind of meeting kind of somewhere in the middle i think that there's no winner takes all necessarily i think mm. that there's always a place for no code and i think there'll always be a place for traditional dev because ultimately you need people who's going to build the you know the no code tools you need dev developers mm, it's, and it's also like bubbles like visual coding yeah yeah no I, i'm super i'm super pumped and just like as we said like it's just still so early even for me and my business and um I think software as a, as a whole and I'm, I'm very like keen to see what happens with no code like last week they just released like bubbles coming to native so now you can build like native apps with it which is like going to be crazy obviously and explain a native app yeah so i mean primarily what bubble is good at is web apps and um, that was like their core thing so web app is like actually a good question people always ask me is like websites versus web apps um which maybe to like me is an obvious answer but a website is like a piece. It's like it's like if you go to your restaurant, right? You go to a rep restaurant website. They just it's like an information. It's just like you can't a billboard. Yeah, it's just a. It's basically just a digital bill billboard. Is a great way to put it. Um, where a web app actually has like ex experience to it. It has functionality. So you know Airbnb, Uber, all these like you know Spotify. Even these are like actual experiences. You log in, you have an account, you pay. So um, Bubble primarily is web app focus. Um, at least it used to be. They just launched or announced that they're launching the native, you know, which basically is iOS, Android apps. So being able to like build an app that goes around someone's phone. They already had PWAs, which are called progressive web apps, which is um, an interesting thing that people actually don't talk too much about, um, which is basically, it's basically a wrapped um, web app that you can kind of download from the browser. So it's almost like, is that like Slack house has, you have slack.com, so you can use Slack at slack.com or you can download Slack. You have an app on your computer and you open Slack and it's like its own thing, not on an internet browser. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, essentially. I would say it's Slack, I don't know if Slack's a PWA, but it probably is like the same. Like, or Discord, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, if one, one thing you can do is like, if, you, if you're on Google, if you're on Chrome, if you go to Starbucks, I think it's like Starbucks website, or it's even if you go like app.starbucks.com, there'll be like a little download button and they'll pop up and you may have never seen that, but that is a PWA. You can basically download that web app or website and turn it into basically a native experience. Um, the advantage of it is that you don't need to go to the app store. So as a developer, mm. you know, 30% goes to Apple and Android. That's a, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so it's also hard to get into the app store, right? Mm -hmm. So PWAs are a great way, and no code is like pretty accessible for it. It's really easy to create like a web app into a, um, a PWA as is, but you know, native's also coming. Um, it's, a, it's a really like clean way to just be able to get someone to download something right to their phone. So a native app would just be like when I use Discord on my computer, like I downloaded Discord yeah. and yeah. it installed into my computer, yeah. and I click that and I'm opening it. So I'm yeah. not going to the internet and then using discord.com i'm literally using the discord app that's yeah. a native app yeah okay cool it's like a like mini clip.com playing online games or downloading a game from steam like on your computer too like yeah, you actually yeah. own the file and basically then pwa is like in the in-between yeah. which is like it's not native it's not technically native it feels like a native app but it's just um you know if you're on your phone like you you may have never even known that you could download websites onto your phone yeah i did not know that yeah so you can um hmm. and uh you know it doesn't it lacks some functionality as native, like, you know, native has like better offline capabilities and obviously just like things like caching and whatever. But if you can figure those issues out, you can solve for Apple basically controlling your app and how well it does. Mm, so Bubble's going to allow native apps though, yeah. where you can literally use it. Like you can create an app that works offline without yep. internet. Yep. Huh. Yep. That's really cool. Yeah. Good to know. Yeah. I didn't know that. Okay. Well, obviously like, you, like Instagram, like you can't really use it without internet, but you know what I mean? Yeah, hundred percent. So I want to ask you, since you were so young when you started this and you're starting software companies now and you're not raising money because like, I feel like 
I feel like there's one path, like let's use Tyler Dank with Beehive, for example. When I talked to him, he worked at Morning Brew for six years and he firsthand saw how the internal systems of a multi-million dollar newsletter works and they invented the referral system and he's building all these internal tools. So that's how he validated it right. in Morning Brew's company being there firsthand. And then it just made more sense for him to just leave, use that validation, that story to pitch to investors, raise two and a half million dollars, then get an A team to build it because he validated it. He knew exactly what they needed to do. And yeah. so he just needed money where the everyday young person, it's much better off to just go out into the world, find someone who will give you a chance to solve their problem then learn bubble and then s like sell that for a few thousand bucks and then build up your agency cash flow. Then take that money to dump into his beehive example through because through your three or four years as a young 20 year old, you will eventually find that one business that has one problem that you can take massive. And if you're stacking up money through your agency, that's essentially the same thing as raising money from investors in a way. Yeah. And so those are the two paths. It's either like work at a company for five years, find the idea, then explain it, raise money, go straight for it, or work through bubble dev services in an agency cash flow for five years, then build a software or build a software the whole time. At, yeah. But you're discovering problems along the way. Yeah, and there's there's one other way, which is I haven't really talked about this. So we our first like venture studio project, we actually partnered with a, a founder. So um, one of my good friends, Campbell Barron, shout out to him, um, is building an app Mantra. So basically it's an AI powered like loom take like mix loom canva like all these like tools and create like a really easy video editing experience uh, it's basically it's a, i mean sorry a good way to put it is like loom mixed with google slides so it's mm. in the google slides format and so he came to us you know probably 2021 um and with this idea and i and you know he previously sold um one of his companies and you know i was very optimistic around what he was looking to do but didn't really have the cash to kind of go build that and so what, what we did was took a good chunk of the company and we built that first product, designed it, came up with, you know, branding and everything. Um, and then they went on to, uh, you know, go raise from, you know, pretty top tier investors and, you know, are now in private beta, I believe, and launching soon. And so I, I don't say that to like brag. I say that because <laughs> you can also just partner with founders that already have these ideas. There, are, there is a no shortage of people with ideas um, and people that have very specialized um, ex experience in, you know, industries. His was media. You know, he, he worked at um, one of the biggest media companies in Canada and he knew that game. And so I don't know that game, but he does. And I'll partner with him and do what I know well. But the reason you're able to do that is because you're a strategic partner that has a skill that right. he needs. Right. So he could sell it. He, un he understood the problem yeah. and he had a means to sell it because he had the network or distribution. And you had the ability to build it no cost to him because yeah. you believe in the idea yeah. you'll front load the cost in exchange for equity yeah. so since you have the skill of making it he has the skill of selling it to perfect partnership yeah. you built the mvp you then use that mvp to raise to yeah. hopefully compete very quickly exactly yeah that makes a lot of sense yeah and that's how and that's the great thing about a dev agency is because you can make a like someone can come to you wanting something built for them then you could see the business opportunity out of it and then you could pitch it to them like hey let's partner up and make this a SaaS. i'll cover the costs you make the intros you get 30, I get 70, whatever it is. Exactly. And then we just dominate here. Yeah. And you could literally build anything for software and it's such a wide open market. You just have to understand the problems that exist. Yep. Back to your point of not, don't try to make money, understand how to create value or find problems to solve. Yeah. yeah and exactly. software is the best. Like I can't explain how software is by far the best business model. Yeah. It's infinite leverage. Yeah. When the ordinary person be can become an engineer, that's, that's really powerful for the world. And I think that's why no code excites me so much is because everybody has ideas. Everybody sees problems in the world, but like a very small percentage of people can actually go build on those. Those are the, you know, engineers of the world, which is like makes up a very small percentage of the world. Um, and so now what you're able to do is turn an everyday person into an engineer, essentially into a problem solver and um, be able to build these technologies in, in ways that they, or, and you know, in ways that normal startup people may not think of because they're very niche, they're very specific. Um, and so I think this is a net positive for the world. 100%. Because if we have more like creators and innovators, we're just gonna get a lot farther, a lot quicker. More problem solved. Yeah, so that's really why I believe in, in no code overall. I think it's just good for humanity. I think yeah. everyone has an app idea. Yeah. Like I think everyone is like, there should be an app for that. Yeah, or they have a software idea. So let's talk to those people right now. Yeah. Say you have an app idea and yeah. say you understand that, okay, 
you know what, after listening to this, bubble is the way, and I'm going to figure out, and you've agreed that you can figure it out in two weeks. Like, you've yeah. seen that you can physically do it. What are the steps do you think that they should go through? Like, yeah. how do they validate the idea? What What is the process to making sure this is a good idea? You yeah. know, what should they do first? Yeah, I mean, you know, as far as, like, building the thing, you kind of have two paths, right? You have the, you know, go hire someone like myself, the agency, the freelancer route, or, you know, if you have zero money to your name and you just want to, you know, learn it, you can go easily learn it yourself. Once you figure out that path, then then you got to kind of think, okay, first off, um, what problem am I trying to solve? I think that's a really hard question for people to actually answer because people are really good at being like, this is the idea. This is, this is how it's going to work. Like, this is why it's going to be the next Uber. But Uber solved a very specific problem, right? They solved the problem of it being really hard to get taxis. And, and they also solved the problem of playing into the fact that people want personal drivers. Um, you know, it's, it's a cool thing to be able to let a click of a button and a car pulls up, right? And so first define that really well. Like define who you're going after, what, you know, what, what, what is the problem? Like how are people currently solving the problem? Once you figure that out, then I think it's like going to talk to that, that audience um, and actually trying to learn like how, how, how are they doing those things? Go answer those questions you probably won't have the best insight off the bat. Um, and then like start like working with them, almost building with them. Um, I call it like, you know, and a lot of people call it like continuous like user interviews, continuous user feedback loop um, of just like constantly building something, taking it to them. How is this? Do you like this? Refine it. Do that again and again and again. And eventually you're going to probably land on something that is like actually valuable to them. But then you can be like, okay, cool. Like, first off, do you know other people that probably have this problem? They probably do if they're a business owner. Um, and if not, then you just go sell it to other people um, and, you know, sell them as a customer as well. Okay, so th I will say that this is something that I think people need to understand as well is, like, how big is the opportunity also? So, like, that's how you, like, find the problem. That's how you identify it. That's how you kind of validate it and yeah. get better. You talk to the people. But at the same time, there is a difference between what we were talking about, like a micro SaaS, a $10,000 a month SaaS. Yeah. Like I, we, anyone can do that. Like yeah. that is not a, you only need to solve like a hundred people's problem really to yeah, get yeah. to a 10K per month SaaS. So it can be a very niche, very specific, and everyone's going to say yes. It's going to be much easier to sell because it's, no one has a solution. You're the only one with the solution. You need to find a hundred people to offer to. But how do you evaluate, okay, this is a $10,000 a month opportunity. Is this a hundred thousand dollar a month or is this like a $10 million software company? what would you be looking for to distinguish that? Because even though it is quick to make software, it also is not like, it's still a time investment. Like it's still gonna take you a months or so to build it, get it into the hands of people, find customers and everything. So you wanna make sure you're choosing the right opportunity. Like if you have five ideas, how do you choose which one to go with? Yeah, I would say like there's two main routes you can go, right? Obviously it's like B2B and B2C, right? So B2C is like you're playing into consumer problems of like, you know, selling to the everyday, Instagram is a B2C, Spotify, all these like things that are just regular consumers are, you know, are buying. Um, and then you have the B2B route, which is like selling to businesses problems. So, so um, that's like Salesforce, Slack. You know. And so I think once, once you determine like which, they both, they both have their advantages. I would say that B2B is very much like sales driven, right? So if you think you're good at talking to people, you like building relationships with people, um, you understand, you know, maybe some nuances around business and operations or want to learn more. Um, that's a great one because you don't, it's not a numbers game as much. Like you really just need, as you said, like even for B2B, like 20 clients paying you, you know, even like mm -hmm. 500, $1,000 a month, like they will pay that. Oh yeah. If, if it, if it's valuable enough and you can even solve, like, if you want to be specific, you could be like, I want to solve food, food management for restaurants in you know, Toronto, Ontario, but you know, you can be that specific and, and just solve that problem. Go like really hard on that. Or you can kind of set your, you know, ambitions a little bit bigger. I would say food management is like, if that's the example we're using, that's a pretty like broad thing like that, that, that entails a lot of problems that go into there's logistics, there's waste management, there's, you know, people and all that stuff. So that's a pretty big, you know, market that you're playing into. There's a lot of problems that you need to solve. And so a good rule of thumb is like the number of problems you're solving, your tool solves, that's usually how big the market is. If you're solving like, I want to make it really easy for my employees to check in and out of work, that's like a one really specific problem, right? But then you can also go, okay, do I want to do that in the US? Do I want to do that in my city? Do I want to do that? What size businesses, right? So you can kind of play how you want, right? 
you can always like go a really specific problem and just be like, I'm going to try to solve this problem for every business on the face of the planet. It's, it'll be a hard goal, but if you do it, like there's an opportunity for it. Right? Yeah. It's the TAM, the total addressable market, right? right? That's the term that people use. Okay. So that's how you find the idea. That's how you want to see if it's a worth pursuing. Right. Then how do you actually go about giving it to the world, bringing it out to the world in your opinion? Yeah, I mean, I think that this shouldn't be done. I think a lot of people make the mistake of like having a launch date and being like, here it is. Product hunt day. Yeah, yeah product hunt day. And it, not that like product hunt isn't valuable, but you should like basically launch the second you talk to a customer the first time. Like you should be like, there shouldn't, maybe there's like the big marketing push. It's like a fake launch. You know? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. It's but been like, live. But. It's, yeah, exactly. Like it should be live. You should have been working on it and iterating with people for like, hopefully months at that point. Um, and then once you know 10 people are paying for this, this is a clear market and a clear problem that we're solving, then that's when you can go like balls to the wall with like, you know, content I think is a great one. Um, you know, just even playing into communities. There's so many like niche communities in Reddit, YouTube. Um, I think Reddit is, if yeah. you don't have like, if you don't have confidence on camera, if you don't want to make a, if you don't want to make content, like Reddit's like, yeah, Powerful. Facebook groups too is so yeah. undertapped, right? If you if you want to solve the dog walking problem, it's just because it's so easy to like you know who ha like you know what the problem you're solving is, and you can easily find groups of people that you know have that problem because it's literally yeah. titled mechanics, yeah, yeah, dog walkers, yeah, exactly, yeah, restaurant managers of Seattle, yeah. <laughs> like you could find that specific of groups of people, yeah, exactly. I don't, I don't, I think people like overcomplicate it. Like it's just like exactly common sense. Like if mm -hmm. you want to find dog walkers, where are you going to find them in a group? You, or you go to a dog. Critical thinking. Yeah, crit we'll call it critical thinking, yeah. not common sense. Sure, critical thinking. Sure. But 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 it's like you, you don't need to be a genius. My point is mm -hmm. to figure that out. Obviously. Oh no. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So you keep mentioning content, and you yeah. keep like leaning towards content, 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 and you're saying not cold outreach. Yes, communities. But why are you so big on content right now? I think that it's pretty clear that like the engines behind like TikTok, YouTube. Um, if you can like play them right, you can get basically unlimited like distribution, unlimited eyeballs. It's no longer like it used to be that if you put, you know, $100 into Facebook, you could almost guarantee a return. Like in the early days of Facebook, like costs were so low. Facebook ads. Yeah, face, sorry, Facebook ads or early any ad network. Any paid ads, like I think, I think people are just kind of sick of it. Unless you have a really creative like video or, you know, ad to run. Mm -hmm. It's not going to like hit the same as it used to when, when ads and it's not personalized, Yeah, it's not personalized. And so I think people, where do they spend most of their time? I think TikTok, Instagram, these platforms, and they buy from people that they trust. I think that's a big thing. Mm -hmm. People aren't just going to like buy your like random drop shipping, like bracelet ad anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't think, um, they buy from people they trust. They buy from, you know, people that they can even relate to and they and then people ultimately buy from stories right mm -hmm. so i think that content is has all those aspects of it it's, it's free and so if you can just like get really good or hire someone that's really good at content you basically have a growth engine on lock right 100 percent. so i do think it's so interesting now that it's all algorithm based it used to be you have to make content get subscribers and then only your subscribers would see your contents. And then if you wanted to get further, you have to run paid ads, but paid ads used to be very effective, mm. but now we've shoved it down people's throats. They've gone the other way. They yeah. hate all ads. It's inauthentic. Yeah. And this is the rise of UGC creators where you're having yeah. everyday people just make reviews of your content yeah. and it's automatic through these uh, organic algorithms that will just recommend videos that the platform thinks you will like because they know you better than you know yourself. Yeah. And so basically distribution's free now. Yeah. And you have a pretty pretty nice TikTok following, I would say. Yeah. And it's pretty niche. And yeah. so it's dense and it's yeah. powerful. Like you don't need a million followers to make money. Like yeah. you can have someone with 10,000 followers can make more than someone with 5 million followers if 100%. it's the most if it's the right group of people. And so tell me about your strategy on TikTok and how it like go ties into your agency. Yeah, yeah. I would say just talking a lot about a lot of the stuff that like I'm personally you know, interested in doing just around SaaS and, and no code and like informing people just like we are here of like the powers of it. Um, and I think a lot of people like no code, like there probably is a good handful of people that will be watching this where this is like their first time hearing about no code. Um, and so for me, it's like just being very specific with that audience and of like just targeting like on tech entrepreneurs that like are looking to build SaaS or softwares. 
Um, and as you said, like you don't need a million people to do that. You, you if you have 10,000 people that like that, that's a lot of business, you know, obviously not all of them are going to be people that are qualified, but like, even if 1% of them is uh, somewhat of a lead and you, you continue to compound that growth over enough time, that's a really nice business right there. Have you gotten an agency client from your TikTok? Yeah, I think we've gotten a couple at this point. That's um, crazy. Yeah. And I, I know like... Um, it's tens of thousands of dollars just from making a, a few TikTok videos. Yeah. I mean, my, mine are like... Uh, I mean, the agency stuff is cool. I've seen people like... I don't know if you've seen the jet business guy. Oh, yeah. He, apparently, he's sold like multiple jets on from Instagram. For sure. It's crazy. It's, there's not a lot of people doing it. Yeah. And people need jets. Yeah. Like, it's a good business. So, so, I mean, that just goes to show, like, there is no, like, limit of, like, what you can sell through content. Like, he's selling $25 million jets through Instagram. Like, there's nothing else. And you have no idea who's watching. Yeah, like, exactly. you have to put it out there. And yeah. I think the number one thing that is most valuable isn't the fact, yes, it's attention. Yes, it's top of funnel. Yes, you can get people in your pipeline. But not even that. It's just somehow if you get someone through cold email or you get someone through a referral, what's the first thing they do? They look you up on Instagram. They yeah. look you up on social media. They, it used to be they Google you, but yeah. now they're going to go straight to your Instagram. What's this person like? What's his life like? Yeah. What's Go to his TikTok. Does he have any social media presence? And they can see that and they're like, wow, this guy really knows what he's talking about. Or wow, something about him I just like. Let me get on the call with this guy. Because if yeah, they yeah. see you on a screen, they just view you like, a super like a, a almost like a celebrity in a yeah. way even if you only have a few hundred followers yeah just seeing you talk gives them a really good first impression and they're going to be way more comfortable way more trusting of you and your agency services because they can see it firsthand yeah yeah i've had many like of those where people will really just be like you looked cool so i wanted to reach out yeah <laughs> you know what i mean it's not that deep yeah and the, and they, sometimes they convert you'd be surprised Cause that's like how the word of mouth gets like triggered too as yeah. well it's like you just have like some, like that's the coolest thing to me is that like our, we publicly been promoting WGMI Labs, our no code dev agency. Yeah. And within three months, we're pretty much at 50K. Yeah. And it's just not even the people who watch my channel. It's the people who watch my channel had someone who wanted to build software. And the people who watch my channel were like, oh, I love Brett. I watch his videos. He has a development agency and yeah. they want to help this person. This person's looking for a development agency. So they're like, hey, you should reach out to this guy. And so they get to do a favor for the person looking for an agency. And then now I'm getting agency clients just from people watching my videos. Yeah. But not directly, which I think is like way over overlooked. Yeah, no, for sure. I think, I mean, th this is like obviously no shock. Like influencer marketing is, is not new. But I think the the power of short form especially is, is an interesting one because it takes so little resources now to create a TikTok. You can literally just put your phone up and just like shoot and like make... And you don't, and the, again, yeah, I'll go deep here. Like we, s we had this idea to build our software for the last like eight months, six yeah. months, April, April is when we started it, when I was talking about it on my YouTube channel and our whole goal is like, okay, it's going to take us some time to build this. We're not going to rush into it. We don't need to get this out in two weeks. Like we want to yep. find the right problem and build it right. And so my only job was to build media. Okay. I need to build a newsletter. I need to get, we need to grow our blog and I need to grow my YouTube channel, grow my followings. And so for the whole time that my partner was building the software and we were planning it all out, I was just building media. So then once the software's ready, we can get distribution. And so the fact that you can do that now so easily and for free, if you have a partner and one of you is focused on that, one of you is focused on getting attention, super team. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's really like the name of the game right now. Software media. That's exactly what you're doing. Like it's not like you're, just, you know, you're, you actually are doing what you're saying and same as me. Like that is the playbook right now is media for distribution, software for scale and, and like actual making money. Um, and I think if you can like really tap into those two, if it's, you know, you doing both or finding someone that's good at one, I think that's like a real business that can like really scale to the millions. Sure. Yeah. And the coolest thing about media, again, I kind of, <laughs> what I wanted to say there, I totally pivoted, got all self aggrandizing, but <laughs> basically is you can build media without your face. So yeah. like my, I didn't build our Instagram at 200K. I didn't build our blog to a million yeah. followers. It's just find someone. So I had my, another partner of mine build these Instagram accounts. And some of these Instagram accounts aren't like a talking head. It's not a personal brand. He just found random like meme pages yeah. or he found like this, he grew a TikTok from zero to 10,000 followers in the last five days. He just did this. And it's just like a random take on news. It's really? like he made like an animated character. He doesn't know how to animate. Made an animated character with AI. Made it look like a talking mouth. And then just wrote an AI voice script. 
and then would put like news on his TikTok. Really? 10,000 followers in five days. Like this happened this week. And so now he has, he's built me an audience of 10,000 people around the specific news topic in five days. And we can just promote our software through that now at any point. Yeah. It's just so, code, yeah. it's just so crazy that you can build this media because these algorithms will just send it to people. Yeah. And so it's like, these are the two most high leverage possible tools to use software and video. And now it's completely free. And now you don't need to code how to build software. So hopefully we've hammered that into people's minds enough. Yeah. But if you guys want to check out Jacob Klug's TikTok, what's your handle? Uh, Jacob S. Klug. Okay. TikTok. Jacob S. K. L. U. G. Klug. K. L. U. G. Uh, sure. I think TikTok is Jacob dot Klug and then okay. Instagram Jacob S. Klug. Okay, cool. Yeah. So if you guys want to hit him up, ask him questions, I'm sure he'll be happy to answer and you can learn a lot yeah. from his TikTok. So definitely go check that out. But also last thing I like to ask people or last two questions is for your agency, what are all the software tools that you use to operate? A lot. Um, I mean, Bubble, obviously, Webflow for our landing page, Stripe for payments, Zapier, um, Slack, Notion. Notion's great. Mm -hmm. Everyone should be using Notion. Um, and probably a few others. Probably those are the main. What are like the niche ones? Do you have any that are like really random, really small tools? Let me think. Take your time. I mean, the one that we use for PWAs, so like there is one, there's an app that we use to like convert bubble apps to PWAs. It's like a subscription. It's pretty specific, obviously, of just like a no-code PWA. That one, you know. Um, That's pretty big for your enterprise clients, I bet. They want like a... Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, even like a lot of like consumer stuff, like where mm. they want like to make it feel like a native app, right? Gotcha. Um, yeah, there's like AI copywriting stuff. It's like so much stuff. I don't even know at this point. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. So lastly, then what is one thing that you thought was true when you were starting your no-code agency and now you believe is completely untrue and you've made a complete 180 and it changed your business's strategy? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think early on I was pretty ambitious that the agency would just be like the winner. But I think I quickly realized that like the agency like is kind of brutal. That's what people don't realize. It's super grueling. Like literally being a, I don't have a boss except for my clients. You know, my clients are my boss. And for anyone that runs the agency, it's the same. Mm -hmm. So I think my initial ambitions were like, let's grow this thing as big as it can get. I think now it's more like, how can we cash flow this to the studio? And that's kind of what we've been doing for the past, you know, six, 12 months. So your first goal was like make 10,000, maybe a hundred thousand dollars with an agency. And then you thought you were going to be living the high life. And then you realize, well, it's not complete freedom. Yeah. And then, you've kind of focused on building software but and then bringing in strategic partners with the venture side. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like hiring people to run the, the studio has been a, a big thing. And so, um, sorry, is Venture Studio, is that basically, what's the difference between like a Venture Studio and like a Venture Capitalist? Yeah, um, Venture Studios are companies that incubate products. So, so you have someone with an idea? Yeah, so someone will come with an idea or I have an idea and we'll just build it and launch it. Mm -hmm. and, then so you, and then you, sometimes you can even go to venture capitalist VCs mm -hmm. in short and go raise on those products. So, so you're basically like in a, the name, I see. Yeah. You're a studio that basically builds yeah. and makes product and, and operates. Right. And then if you need more capital to operate, you can go to a VC. Yeah, VCs are just cash. And so it's like, if I have an idea, I don't really want to do anything. Yeah. You'll, will you even do sales and distribution and marketing? Or are you only doing development? Yeah, we're, we're really only like product. I mean, uh, you can't, you can't, um, I don't think you can agency fi a whole startup. That'd be, if someone can do it, like reach out. But like, well, then they, yeah, you, why even give the person with the idea equity? Yeah, you exactly. know, like, like, so, I mean, you need, you need a driving force. I think for any business, you need that one person, usually the founder, that's really going to drive, if it's not product, then drive marketing and sales. Um, and then that's, that's kind of when we're, we play in to kind of balance that product side out. Um, but I think kind of going back to it, like I genuinely really enjoy the product stuff. And so that's why I like obsess over it. And mm -hmm. that's why that's what, that's the only thing we do. Mm -hmm. If I liked marketing, I would go do marketing or I would offer that as a, as a thing, as a service as well. But I, I just don't like marketing and there's plenty of people that do like marketing. You like, have the TikTok content. I do, but <laughs> I have a team, team kind of doing that yeah. and I'm just kind of like the face. And honestly, it's not like. I don't necessarily enjoy like doing mm -hmm. it. I just kind of do it's it. Kind of necessary in this day and age. Yeah, um, I think I think that like you don't need to know. It's good to have a base, but you don't need to know everything about everything, right? Like have your one lane, 
get really good at it. Be like, try to be the best at it. And then like, go find someone that like matches that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't express how nice it is to just only have to make content. And yeah. then my partner does all the back end operating. Like it yeah. is, I would be miserable and being a solopreneur would be so stressful, yeah. but that's how you have to start. So, but everybody, Jacob Clug, I appreciate you coming yeah. on and sharing the Thank game. You. Brother. I nice seen you. You too.